What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Julie Mitchell. How you doing, Julie? Hi, Chief. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. I didn't get a chance to tell you last show because you weren't there. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So uh, we have a, an amazing guest today that uh, has lived a life of service to our country and then followed his passion of writing once he retired. So uh, without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. So we're so excited about today's guest. He is a New York Times bestselling author who also spent 21 years in the Army, including 18 years in Special Forces. His latest novel, American Trader, a Pike Logan novel, right here. It uh, hit the shelves this week. And good news, you can find it at your exchange. Please give a big chief chat welcome to Brad Taylor. Hey, hey, Brad. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Brad, it's a pleasure Brad. to be here. It is a pleasure to have you and for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from today. You can share some love with Brad in the comments and leave questions for him too and we will read them live. It's also a great time to start a watch party so you can enjoy this chat with your friends. And if you're not already following us, um, you should because Chief Chats are every Tuesday and Thursday. And if you follow along with us, you will know about the great guests we have coming up in the future. Hey. Brad, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you as well. Absolutely. So we're super excited to have you with us today. Uh, can you tell the, the viewers where you're joining us from and uh, how you've been faring during the pandemic? Uh, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. I call it the promised land. The promised uh, land. And we have not been faring well. My wife is in quarantine right now. She has COVID. So. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's not been working out well for me. So there's no bail or something? Does she have a bail that she is the ring? And She's getting, well, yeah, ex exactly you, right. You have to slide the the give me some Gatorade. <laughs> Man, oh, well, my gosh. We, wow. we, are, we are praying for your wife. As she, as she's she getting better. I, I don't, uh, she's, she's actually, she's got out of quarantine. Today was her day out of quarantine. She's doing better now. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Good. Start 2021 off right. on a better note than 2020. <laughs> So, um, Brad, you spent 21 years in the Army, retired in 2010 as a Special Forces Colonel. Well, thank you for your service. What called you to serve? And then how has your Army career influenced your writing? Uh, actually, I'm uh, kind of like a lot of people that win the military. I, I wasn't called to serve. The Army found me. I didn't find the Army. <laughs> the, uh, um, I was in college. and As a freshman in college, I was a horrible student. I was flunking out of school. And my father told me that uh, you flunk out of school, you're going to the army. And I was like, the army, what is he talking about? He was in the air force. I was born in Okinawa. So he, he was you know, in the service as well. And uh, I was convinced I was flunking out of the army or flunking out of college. And so I researched the army and I grew up in Texas in rural land in Texas, hunted all the time, camped all the time. And uh, I was like, they're going to pay me to jump out of airplanes and run around the woods with a gun. This doesn't look that bad. Yes. And so as fate would have it, I did not flunk out of school. So what I call my second freshman year, I joined ROTC, said, I'm, I'm going in the army. That's what I'm going to do. So the army kind of found me. I didn't seek it out. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that is awesome. So, um, you, so, uh, you, you did the army time and, uh, you, you special forces. So I'm sure you got a chance to, to be a part of some, some, some very yeah. unique situations and, and, uh, uh, and do all that cool cool stuff that the special operators do. Uh, so after that, you begin your second career, and, and your second career is like a best selling author. Like that's 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 cool. That's cool too. So uh, what what led you down to, to to writing, or you know, why was that your passion? Well, it actually, uh, uh, and I didn't answer the second part of her question. You know, how does my writing is it infused by my past? It obviously is. It it, it couldn't help but not be. Uh, I mean, if you were going to write uh, a scene about you know, how learning how to ride a bike, what would you think about? You'd think about what it took to ride a bicycle. So when I write about operations, when I write about, you know, gunfights and that kind of stuff, I can't help but refer back to my, my past. Um, I don't, you know, it's just something that naturally occurs. I, I never set out to be a writer. I honestly, I was in a special mission unit at Fort Bragg and I came down to Citadel to teach as a break from deployments. Cause after nine 11, I was gone, you know, basically forever. And um, I was going to do a two year, reset and then go back into the fight and during that two-year reset i had a lot of time on my hands from where i come from to what i was doing i had a lot of time on my hands 
And so I told my wife, hey, I'm going to write a book. And I thought I'd sit on the bedside table. And my mom would say it's a good book and that'd be the end of it. And um, it sold. I came out on the promotion list for Full Colonel. My daughter was entering high school. My next assignment, I'd already been told, was two years unaccompanied to Southwest Asia. Uh, and the book sold. And so I had a lot of hard choices to make. And um, I decided to uh, turn down the promotion and give writing a try. And that's how it came about. And that's awesome. That, that is, um, and I think some of us kind of toy with different things as we're going through our military career on uh, which path we should go. And, uh, but, you know, follow, I tell my airmen all the time, uh, just, just be happy, whatever your decision is. Absolutely. If you want to, if you want to go do 30 years, or if you want to do 20 years or four years, or absolutely. years, just, you know, try to find that path to happiness. And I'll tell you, you'll miss it when you're gone. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you do three years of 30, you're going to yeah. miss it when you're gone. Absolutely. Well, you definitely followed your heart and it led to some success for you. Clearly, um, Pike Logan, excuse me, is a recurring character in your novels. Is he based on anyone from your military days? And then what kind of inspired you to create him? Yeah, he definitely is. He's an amalgamation of people I've served with. He's not me. But I get that question all the time. Are you Pike Logan? I'm like, no, I'm not Pike <laughs> Logan. And the, uh, uh, the example I usually use is that it, there's probably 1% of the world that can play on the PGA Tour. I mean, just 1% of the world. It's very hard to get to the level of special operations that I was at. Uh, but on the PGA Tour, there's Tiger Woods, and there's a guy who's 100th on the money list. Nobody's ever heard of the guy 100th on the money list. He's yeah. playing on the tour, though. Absolutely. I'm 100th on the money list, and Pike Logan is Tiger Woods, and I've served with plenty of Pike Logans. They're out there, uh, and they they absolutely do the nation's justice. Awesome, and so your novels also have like a tremendous amount of detail and background, so uh, how much research kind of goes into uh, when, when you are, are doing a novel, or is it basically, uh, I, I lived it, so I, I'll, I'll no. oh, okay, gotcha. It's absolutely an enormous amount of research. <laughs> I mean, for little things like, so the AK-47, somebody shooting AK-47, does that thing lock open on the last round or does it bolt closed? I, I can't remember. So I have to do research. You know, <laughs> yeah. what, what does that thing do? To so the big things like American traders about China, uh, the geopolitics of China and Taiwan. Uh, and I, you know, I was a PACOM guy back in the day. Uh, and then, you know, 9-11 happened and I became a Mideast guy. And so I had to really delve into, you know, what are the geopolitical considerations of China? What's going on with Hong Kong? What's going on with Macau? Uh, what's going on with Taiwan, the elections in Taiwan. And so it's an enormous amount of research. I mean, I traveled to Taiwan. Anything that's in that book that you're, you're going to read is uh, I've been there. I went all over Australia. It's, it's a lot of research. It's not easy. I wish I could just spout it out. But I, <laughs> I can't. Well, some, some people have that gift of just being able to just get, get st or be a part of something and remember stuff like my old boss, he can remember dates from, from like... Yeah. 40 years ago. And I'm like, how do you remember those dates? Like, I can't even remember what I used. Well, I'll tell you this. If you do something, if I write, you know, when I write the book, I'll get an email if I make a mistake. For instance, One Rough Man, my very first book, um, I uh, uh, had Pike carjack a uh, Chevy Cutlass. And I get emails to this day that tell me, Oldsmobile made the Cutlass. Chevy didn't make the Cutlass. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is I actually had a Cutlass in college. I, I just didn't bother research it because I'm like, I had one. It was a Chevy. No, yeah. it was an Oldsmobile. <laughs> well, the research that you do it makes you write with authority and then gives you an authenticity. So 15 novels uh, roughly in, in roughly 10 years. That's a lot. That's a, it's a huge um, undertaking. How have you been able to maintain that kind of pace, um, especially with all the research that's required? Yeah, well, I was kind of a victim of my own circumstances. So <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote One Rough Man and, I, and it, the book was out there, I still had to put food on the table. So I uh, became a private military contractor, worked for mm -hmm. you name a company, I've worked for them. Um, and I, I would look at my schedule and say that uh, uh, the book is due in January. Uh, I've got contracts from July until January. So I get the book done in July. Well, then I'd scream at my publisher and say, why aren't you putting the book out? Why aren't you putting the book out? And they would say, hey, guess what, Brad? You're not the only author we have. Calm down. <laughs> You're not. No. But the, the problem with that is I write current events. And so anything could happen in the world that would destroy the book. And uh, so I kept doing that. Uh, and by my fourth novel, they said, all right, we'll do one every six months if you want to do that. And I 
stupidly said, okay, let's do that. <laughs> and so for about four years, I was doing two books a year, which required me to do the book uh, research overseas required the, uh, you're basically promoting one book while you're writing a second book and while you're editing a third book. And I also do novellas and short stories as well. Uh, and it was crushing. I mean, I, um, I look back on that time and I'm like, I don't know how I did that. Wow. <laughs> Eventually I said, no mas, no mas. I, I <laughs> <just face." laughs> yeah, that, that is a crazy, crazy pace. Um, but so, but as you know, um, you know, our exchange family, it includes uh, soldiers, airmen, guardian, uh, uh, Marine sailors, Coast Guard members and their military families that are watching. Uh, do you have any words of inspiration or thanks for uh, our, our nation's heroes? Oh yeah, I, I, I mean, I'll say thank you for your service. And I know that sounds trite. People tell me that all the time and I don't really like it when they do it in the malls or whatever. But for me to, to the people serving, I, some of my, I, I like going to the Atlanta airport and seeing a bunch of people that just got out of basic training and they're heading their first duty post. Oh yeah, yeah. A gaggle of people walking along, their uniforms don't really fit well and they, they haven't put the, you know, their little metal on correctly and they look lost. And I think to myself, one of those persons is gonna be Sergeant Major of the Army one day. Absolutely. And the, all those, the, I would say that the, what I would say is enjoy what you're doing, uh, whether it's three years or 30 years, you're really going to miss it when it's gone. And I, I never thought I would. Um, and I certainly do. And what you're doing is, uh, I mean, it's work for the nation and people can say that and they don't really believe it. I believe it. And everything, I don't care if you're a, a heavy wheeled mechanic or you're on the tip of the spear with special forces, you are serving the nation and you are protecting the nation and enjoy the time you have there because you'll miss it when it's gone. So can you talk to us a little bit about your latest novel, American Trader? Um, it just, I have it right here. And it just came out this week, I believe, um, Tuesday yeah. the 5th. So yep. brand new to the shelves. And how did you choose a conflict between China and Taiwan as the focal point for this piece? Yeah, they, so a lot of times people always say that I'm prescient, I predict the future, which I really don't. I just keep <laughs> tap of what's going on in the yeah, world. Exactly. This thing's been kind of a slow burn. I, uh, I was writing Operator Down. I was in Lesotho, Africa, which is a small nation in Africa. And that book was about a coup. So I had to see the parliament buildings and the police station, things like that inside Lesotho. And uh, the parliament buildings were all brand new. All the government buildings were brand spanking new. They were still constructing them. And they had a bunch of Chinese lettering outside, which I assume said something like, uh, you know, wear a hard hat if you come in here. But Chinese lettering in Lesotho, Africa? I, was, I asked the guy I was with, what's up with that? Oh, the Chinese are building this. And I said, what for? Well, because they just want to be nice. And I was like, eh, I don't think yeah. they want to be nice. They want <laughs> something out of this. And that was my first inroad into the Belt and Road Initiative, real world inroad um, that I, from China. And so they kept popping up. They kept popping up. Hong Kong went bad. They, they had, all these things kept popping up. The Spratly Islands, they were doing, uh, taking over the Spratly Islands, building on military bases there. Uh, and I started doing a heavy amount of research into China and what their global aspirations were. And, and, and you know, the NBA, the, um, somebody tweeted about, I'd support Hong Kong from the NBA, the coach of the Houston Rockets. And China said, well, you're not going to play in China anymore, which is a huge amount of loss for the NBA. Immediately, everybody was siding with China. Um, the new Top Gun movie is coming out. And in the trailer, Tom Cruise puts on his iconic leather jacket. Well, there's a difference on that jacket from 1986 to now. The Taiwanese flag is gone. So oh. they have an enormous amount of pressure, economic pressure to bring it to bear. And, and it built up until I was like, I'm going to write about that. Man. You are, you are speaking the future. You, you, you are a fortune teller. <laughs> so so how, how has uh, COVID-19, uh, well, the quarantine itself, how, how has that helped or hindered your writing? Is it, I mean. Oh, oh, oh. It's horrible. <laughs> so I went to Taiwan and Australia, did all the research. And usually I'll, I'll jump the book forward about nine months. So when the book gets released, like right now, I'm writing about right now. Well, I got home and uh, um, started writing the book. You know, I was banging it all out. And then COVID hit. Everything got locked down. I was like, how, do, how am I going to put that in a book? So, the, I mean, I was in Shinlin Night Market in uh, Taipei, which is just a mass of people, thousands of people all pushing each other. Well, now it's closed. <laughs> you know, Pike's doing a surveillance operation in Sydney. How's he going to do that when the only people on the street are the target and him? 
And you can't fly anywhere. The planes aren't flying. Nobody's allowed anywhere. And so it was a huge mess. And I decided to set the book uh, right at the uh, Taiwanese elections, which works out better anyway, uh, right before COVID hit. Um, but COVID has not been kind to writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not been kind at all. Well, I didn't, I didn't know maybe maybe uh, the fact that you got a chance to slow down and, and kind of be able to kind of concentrate maybe more on writing. I, I don't know. No, because I mean, my kids came home from school. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. You got to be a te- you got to be a teacher. And you got to talk. Kinda- locked out. I mean, it's just you're locked in the house and you're yeah, it just not been conducive at all. I, I there's places I'll go to write. You know, libraries they're all closed. I mean, everything just shut down. And yeah. just, you'd think that it'd be like. Uh, um, oh, you got a pandemic. That's a perfect thing for a writer. He can just go in a bedroom and write all day, but it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I come to work to I come to work just to do my podcast. I'm supposed to be teleworking from home, but I got I got a busy household. So I was like, you know what? The only place I can get some peace and quiet is here at work. So uh let, you know, I got all my, my kids and my dogs are all locked in a bedroom. <laughs> like I got a Zoom call. Get in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You they can come out. <laughs> yeah. So uh can you can you can you give us some kind of details on your writing style? Like, is there certain days you want to sit down and, and, and do your writing or do you, do you always know how the novel's going to go or? No, I, um, when I originally first started writing, cause I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't have any instruction in writing. I just wrote. My instruction has been reading. That's, I read a lot. And so I just wrote a book and you've got your entire life to write your first book. I mean, that's- Yeah, 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 exactly. That's forever. <laughs> <laughs> your next book's going to be <laughs> so you better crank that one out. And so what I tried to do is uh, people say, you know, conventional wisdom is, you know, put a thousand words out a day, 2000 words out a day. Uh, no matter what you do, you have to write something. And uh, I learned, I've learned to trust myself that that I always end up deleting that if I force it out. <laughs> and I, I learned that uh, people talk about writing as if the, when you're typing on the keyboard, that's not writing to me. I'm always writing. So if I'm in the shower or running PT or doing whatever I'm doing, I'm thinking, I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And I'll wait until that percolates in my head. And then I do what I call typing. Then I'll put it on the page. But uh, some days I can go weeks without writing and other days I'll type, you know, 8,000 words a day. My record's 8,000 words a day for five days straight. Oh my gosh. (laughs) But that was operator down. And I was on a deadline too, so. <laughs> gotcha. I mean, I, I cranked out. Actually, I was on a security contract. I was in the barracks. And there was no <laughs> Wi-Fi, no TV, nothing. So I was just banging away. <laughs> well, Brad, oh, we, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chief. Oh, no, no. So I'm I'm, I'm putting a plug for me and Julie so we, we can end up in the next book as like a cash <laughs> register. We can work the cash register or something. <laughs> we, could, we could have our own character, Julie. If you people put in a plug for the book, I end up killing them in the book. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I do. Uh, uh, I've auctioned off characters for charity quite often. Yeah, well, that's, oh, that's a great idea. Them. So if we have an editor, <laughs> let's go to other places. And then yeah. when they, they always, they, I, I tell them that, you know, I, I can't guarantee you who you're going to be. And I can't promise you you're going to be the good guy. You could be the bad guy. <laughs> and so man. I had a guy who, he said, I want, uh, and he didn't read the write up. And uh, it was a male, female Marine Corps team on actually Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. And uh, he gave me two male names. And I was like, uh, one of them's a female. <laughs> he, <you> know, <laughs> hey, enormous amount of money for these characters. I'm like, I got a, I need a female name. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, re- I'm retracting my last, my last statement because I don't want to die in the book. You don't want to be the bad guy? <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll take on that role for you, Chief. Thanks, <laughs> I volunteer. Um, So Brad, we have um, service members and military families watching from all over the world. And I just wanted to touch um, on some of the comments that we're receiving. So one, one, one person has a question. Her name is Heather. And she says, what do you miss about not being able to do your normal book tour? Uh, I miss meeting the fans. I, I did a virtual book launch on Tuesday and uh, the tours themselves are really grueling. I mean, you do four cities a day and you're getting no sleep and you're missing food. Um, but when you connect with the fans and they really have good questions about where the novel's going, sometimes they really stump me. Sometimes you're put on the spot and you're like, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> but what I miss is connecting with the fans, most of all. Uh, being The virtual thing just is not the same. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. It's harder, I think, to read people um, 
virtually versus like in person. And um, there's I think yeah. something to be said about, you know, meeting somebody that you're excited to meet. Like if people, right. your fans are excited to meet you in person and not kind of lose us something over, over virtual, yeah. but we, we are happy that you're making time for us today. Don't oh, get no, me no, wrong on that <laughs> at all. So we also have, um, see what else we have. Um, so Heather also asks, and I hope you know what this means. Um, uh, how's D D C O E feeling today? Okay, so my wife is known as a DCOE, the deputy commander of everything. Oh. <laughs> she's feeling better. She, she's coming out of her COVID slumber and she's doing okay. So she's the DCOE. She runs the- uh, I got you, guys. <laughs> That is awesome. And then she's, you said that she's out of quarantine today. So her isolation is ending. So that's good for you, for her and for your family. Um, so Celia Anthony says, hola. And we have other people watching. Somebody just said, um, oh, I just, I just lost it. I'm so sorry. But um, we have Tony's watching. He says, hello. We have the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base Exchange. Uh, they are watching, saying hello as well. So great people um, watching with us today. So, oh, Heather also wants to know, Heather's clearly a fan. Um, she says this is in she says this is in one of your books. So about an airplane that crashed in South America. In South America, yeah. So that would be uh, uh, Days of Rage, yeah. Off yeah. the coast of South America, actually in the ocean. So did you actually have? Were you in like? So you weren't in a, a plane crash or anything, or or were you? No, no, no. I actually no. the okay. uh, uh, I did the research on the Gulf Stream Air and how the thing functions and. And then I blew it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man, excellent. You such a beautiful mind over there, Brad. <laughs> So as a reminder to our viewers, American Trader can be found at uh, your local exchange and shopmyexchange.com. So Brad, can you remind us where can we keep up with you and with Logan online? Uh, you can go to my website, bradtaylorbooks.com. And there's actually excerpts of all of my novels uh, for free. You can get a taste of the writing for all that. And you see all the right. novellas and everything else. And I got a national security blog on there too. Awesome. Oh, very cool. So bradtaylorbooks.com. Yeah. So, uh, and my last question is, uh, do, do you see, because we talked about these um, series uh, before the, uh, like, television series, do you do you see your stuff going to the main screen at all, or, or I, is, is, know, that, is that a desire a of, for you? Um, Hollywood's a weird animal, and I've had a lot of interest, um, but the thing is, when you sell the rights to your books, you basically sell the rights to your books. Oh, right? gotcha. They own it, and so I always look at the person who's, you know, offering to option the rights do they one really intend to make a movie or a series or streaming thing or whatever? And two, are they going to hold the books to the standards that I hold them to? I mean, once you sell the rights, you, they can make Pike Logan a midget and they can make Jennifer Cahill, you know, yeah. whatever <laughs> it's, they own the rights to it. And so I, at this point, I've just been kind of cowardly about it. I've been too, I've been reluctant to sell the rights. So it hasn't happened yet. Gotcha. Be like selling a part of yourself, right? You got to make sure, I mean, if you do that, whoever's, like you just said, taking your characters that can do with whatever they want to with them. I mean, that's, right. that'd be a huge decision. Something you clearly poured tons of time and research and effort into. So yeah, I see what they're, they're, um, uh, how they feel about it. I mean, you, you're going to have a director that's got his vision. You're going to have an actor that has his vision. Do they really want the author standing behind him with his vision? Yeah. Or they just say, <laughs> no, cut it off. You're, <laughs> you sell the rights, you're done. We'll do our vision <laughs> and you'll be happy with it or not. And so far I've been kind of reluctant to do that. Okay. Yeah. That's good stuff. Well, Brad, we, we absolutely appreciate you spending some time with us today. Um, America's airmen, soldiers, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members uh, appreciate you. And, Did and you say guardians? That's now guard official nomenclature. The theme. Yeah. Yes, the, the official nomenclature <laughs> of the Space Force is guardians. <laughs> it is uh, a thing. The first time I've heard it mentioned, but okay. Oh, I mean, oh, I knew yes. it was coming. <laughs> yes, so it, it just, this, this just is a real thing probably about two to three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw it. I mean, I keep up with all that stuff, but I, oh, yeah, yeah. I've never heard anybody say it before. Yes. <laughs> Take Pike to space next, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. <laughs> we, got, we got to put the Guardians in the book now. So. I'll have to, because I mean, I, I got beat up for not having Marines, so now I've got a Marine Force recon guy in there. I got beat up for not having Air Force, so I've got a CCT guy in there. So, I mean, it seems, it's definitely a joint team. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, just thank you for your service and all that you've done for this great nation. And we wish you all the best in 2021. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a good time. Thanks. Thanks for being with us. Congrats on the book and Chief Chat out. Chief Chat out.